All right, so later in the program, Charles and I will discuss affirmative action. And uh, Kathy and I will be talking about the impact of climate change on current and future food production. But first, it is my delight to welcome uh, Guy McPherson to the program. Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it, gentlemen. And I, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that you are kind of the, um, the, the lead climate scientist that other climate scientists like to dislike. <laughs> well, they certainly like to dislike me, although I've never called myself a climate scientist. Yeah, and you, um, and you, uh, and you do you believe strongly and have held this contention for a while that uh, climate change, the way it's heading, will in the near future result in human extinction. Would you like to um, lay that out for us? Yeah. In fact, my response to this question is particularly long, so I'd appreciate you giving me a few minutes to answer. Okay. Soon after we lose habitat for our species, all individuals of our species will die. That's just the way it works. We need to have habitat. That's the case with all species, including at least eight species in the genus Homo, our, our genus, that have already gone extinct, primarily as a result of rapid changes in planetary temperature. So it's not as if there isn't some precedence for the members of the genus Homo species within the genus Homo going extinct as a result of rapid changes in planetary temperature. All species need habitat to survive. And I don't want to get into too much detail on what habitat means, but the bottom line is it's organism-specific. It relates to the ability of a species to secure everything needed to survive and also to reproduce. And already humans are losing habitat throughout the world for our continued survival. Now, that said, we have already passed the point of no return in the climate crisis. Even the incredibly conservative political body, known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which from now on I'll call the IPCC, admitted on October 8, 2018, that Earth is in the midst of the most rapid environmental change in planetary history. Mm -hmm. they, they cited peer-reviewed papers that conclude, quote, these global level rates of ch human driven change far exceed the rates of change driven by geophysical or biosphere forces that have altered the trajectory of the Earth system in the past. Even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human driven change. So that line comes from the IPCC report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees. Less than a year later, the IPCC also concluded that climate change is irreversible in its September 24th, 2019, Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere and a Changing Climate. And here's the signature quote from that report, which concluded that an overheated ocean was responsible for the irreversibility of climate change. Quote, Ocean acidification and deoxygenation, ice sheet and glacier mass loss, and permafrost degradation, degradation are expected to be irreversible on timescales relevant to human societies and ecosystems. End quote. And this report quoted five peer-reviewed papers in reaching this conclusion. So in other words, based on two reports issued less than a year apart, the IPCC has concluded that climate change is abrupt and irreversible, respectively. And the IPCC is an incredibly conservative organization, as pointed out, even in the conservative peer-reviewed literature. So, yeah. you know... <laughs> Even before these two reports were published by the IPCC, the peer-reviewed literature concluded we were, and are, headed for the loss of all life on Earth as a result of rapid environmental change. And but even some, even some who uh, put out that, that statement don't necessarily agree with that. They, they, they agree with the uh, analysis, but not the final conclusion, correct? Absolutely, that's correct. Yes, lots of people agree that we are experiencing the most rapid change in planetary history, but we'll be fine. Now, in contrast, consider this. An article in Scientific Reports, which is an open access journal as part of the renowned Nature series, was published on November 13, 2018, written by conservation biologists Strona and Bradshaw, and the paper concluded that all life on Earth will, will likely go extinct as a result of a 5 or 6 degree C increase in the global average temperature. And the evidence I've uncovered, all published in peer-reviewed journals, indicates we could hit that mark not within a few hundred years, but within a few decades. And remember, we've already eclipsed the 2C Rubicon. So things, 
things are changing very rapidly, and yeah. it's that rate of environmental change that dictates whether a species will be able to adapt and survive. And I think that's an important thing that is frequently very, off, very frequently overlooked. Doug, we go back to your initial premise or you know, statement, which is that you know other Homo species have already preceded us uh, into extinction. And um, maybe you could clarify, because I, I, I would assume that most people don't understand that 98% of all life on Earth that existed at one time has gone extinct because of habitat changes, weather changes, climate, I'm sorry, not weather changes, climate changes. Comets. Right. Well, or whatever, you know, right. kind of events. So uh, are we talking about uh, glaciation and ice ages as eradicating other homo species? What are we talking about? Interestingly, it's almost always planetary warming that causes species extinction in the genus Homo. Mm -hmm. And that, who, who would be, you know, for instance, which one of our, our predecessors uh, would you... I mean, are we saying that, for instance, Neanderthals went extinct because of habitat changes? Uh, or oh, Neanderthals almost certainly went extinct as a combination of changes in the environment and also outright murder by the oh, more sure. su more successful homo sapiens that came right. along. Okay. But it's the it's the half a dozen species before Homo neanderthalensis showed up that we're talking about as being affected almost exclusively by planetary right. temperatures. Yeah, I, you know, I, and I talked about this previously that the sad part of all this is that we've kind of wasted probably one of the most temperate periods in in right. the climate history of the earth. Absolutely. Uh, That's absolutely and, correct. Right, and that, you know, by the Industrial Revolution basically put an end to that. And now, as you say, um, this is the norm. I mean, the norm for species on Earth is to become extinct. Right, um, and it's more than 99% of species that have ever existed. But, 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 but it's rare that a species will, uh, will <laughs> work itself into extinction. Usually it's got some exterior um, help. Uh, but, yeah, but let me, let me uh, because I don't think we understand. We don't, we don't totally understand the synergisms of what we do um, and, you know, the chaotic nature of phenomena. Sure. Which is, uh, and that's because, you know, we, we, we're totally deterministic science, a very a very literal deterministic science, and that's not the way things work at this level. Let me, let me ask you something, a, a Guy. A, a David Wallace Wells, a very well-known author, The Uninhabitable Earth, seemed to be pretty much in your camp Recently, I'm just like last week, I think it was, in, in the New York Times, uh, I'll quote, Wallace Wells sees that the level of doom he once predicted is much less likely. While five degrees of warming once seemed possible, scientists now estimate that the Earth is on track to warm by two to three degrees. And Wallace says, quote, I've grown more optimistic than I used to be. Is Wallace, is Wallace Wells wrong? Yes, of course he is, and he's lying besides. Let me explain. Okay. First of all, we're already past two. Secondly, even the incredibly conservative political body known as the IPCC admits that we have triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops that will greatly accelerate the rate of change. Okay, now let's talk about Wallace Wells a little bit. He wrote a well-read well article based on a three-hour conversation he had with me and my partner. It's a beautiful work of pure plagiarism that produced a best-selling <laughs> book and a best-selling uh -oh. television series. He's... I He's, I did not know I hit that nerve, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he stole every single idea and almost all the words from me. He's making a lot of money off my work. Of course he's offering hope, none of which is rooted in evidence. In addition, according to the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, hope is defined as follows, quote, to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true, end quote. In other words, to hope is to wish. I want a lot of things to happen to be true. Wishing doesn't make them so. But Hope spell, sells books and it sells television series. Truth? Not so much. In fact, Wallace Wells was to be the primary target of my legal efforts. Our first lawsuit would have taken him to court. However, my friend Gerald Maples, who was working pro bono on my behalf for about two years, slept on a dock in the Bahamas and died on December 4th, 2020. Another legal team responded to my call for assistance via email on September 28th, 2022, so this is not very long ago. 
About a week later, this legal team received a blood-soaked message from somebody going by the name The Executioner. Not surprisingly, my final message came from this legal team about a week after my first message. It was comprised of only three words. Walk away, guy. So why don't they just, why don't they just take you out instead? Go right to the source. The defamation campaign against me was so stunningly successful that there is no need. I haven't been interviewed by a major corporate media outlet till today for five years. <laughs> till today, that's exactly right. And that, you know, I used to be on the news on a pretty regular basis, and for five years, not much. So, in terms of detractors, uh, Michael Mann, also another friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, mean, man, I, 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 I know I, this, this much. I know I didn't know you had a, that, that that relationship with David uh, Wallace Wells. But Michael Mann, that's pretty well publicized. He's the uh, Penn State climate scientist who said earlier this year, um, "quote It will only take a few years after net zero emissions for carbon levels in the air to start to go down." because of carbon being sucked up by the oceans and forests. Is that scientifically defensible? It certainly sounds very optimistic if it is, but is it defensible? No, absolutely not. There is a minimum 10-year lag between the maximum heating produced by CO2 emissions and the maximum heating. So any carbon dioxide released today takes 10 years to reach its level of maximum heating. In addition, and that's from a peer-reviewed paper published more than eight years ago. I don't have the reference with me right now. But you can find it in my work, most notably in an essay at GuyMcPherson.com called Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored. Anyway, a more recent peer-reviewed paper indicates that the larger the emission, the longer it will take for the heating to decelerate up to thousands of years. So to, to claim that we're going to solve this thing in a matter of a few years is either rooted in ignorance or, or more likely it's an outright lie. Now, maybe part of where man's coming from is that he doesn't want people to give up hope. I mean, one thing he said, uh, I'll quote again, doomism has become far more of a threat than denialism. It almost sounds like a direct reference to your work. Yes, absolutely. In, in fact, he referred to me as a doomist cult hero in an article in the Washington Post. And when I was on speaking tours after that, I'd point that out and I'd say that he got it wrong. I'm a doomist cult superhero, not a doomist cult hero. <laughs> well, what does your cape look like? So, so Guy, given, you know, it was interesting, this, the information that you're quoting is all out there. Um you know, it's not being hidden. The IPCC report. Well, that and, yeah. and, and you know, there's various open access uh, entities that anyone can get into. So, um, I guess my first question is, since you you believe this to be true, what what should humanity do at this point? I have been proposing for many years, along with my partner, the idea of planetary hospice. And planetary hospice would include telling the truth, treating everybody like we treat our ancient dying grandmother. Tell her the truth and expect the same from her. That's at the individual level or at the family level. At the community level, let's try to address the horrors that are found in every community within this set of living arrangements, things like racism and misogyny. There's, there's a lot of work that we could do at the community level that would make lives better for people who aren't necessarily, oh, I don't know, Caucasian males like me. You know, heterosexual Caucasian males have experienced a lot of privileges because of the way they look. And I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go. In addition, at the level of society, we could do what I think is absolutely necessary if we are to allow conditions that permit other species to survive in our wake. And that is immediately begin shutting down, safely shutting down nuclear power plants. 
And the reason for that is ionizing radiation has been demonstrated in the peer-reviewed literature to strip away stratospheric ozone. And when you strip away that stratospheric ozone, the planet will heat up very, very quickly. As in, I, I don't know if you saw the 2021 film Finch, but it did a remarkable job showing what happens very subtly. It never never came out and said it's from the nuclear power plants melting down, but but because that had happened, people would put their hand out in the sun and in a matter of seconds, it would be fried. Now, that's a little bit of artistic license and probably it would take a few minutes, not a few seconds. But this is an important factor that I don't know anybody is addressing. So, uh, you know, human extinction, you're talking about complete end of Homo sapiens and all the, all other life on the planet. Um, you don't see a remnant of some species, including human beings, surviving somehow? Certainly not humans. We're big vertebrate mammals, and vertebrate mammals are already on their way out. Um, in in how fact... About, how about colonies um, on Mars and the moon led by uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos? You know, we, we didn't even manage to take care of habitat on this planet. And we think we're going to go create it on another planet and then maintain it? With people like Jeff Bezos leading the way? Come on. <laughs> the man tries to send a pickup truck or whatever that was into Musk. space. Oh, that was Musk, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, that was Musk. I, I get my billionaire up too, it's right, fine. Right, I confuse yeah. my billionaire, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's even those who are, I think, share, share your viewpoint of just how dire the situation is um, from my conversations and and my, my readings, uh, they they're still hold out some hope that, that some element of humanity will survive, perhaps in bunkers in South Dakota, or maybe... Uh, well, the people who are going to survive in bunkers in South Dakota are going to be the wealthy. Sure. And those are resources. So we're just going to be starting a society from exactly the same place. I mean, yeah. Not that it works. Not. In addition, we're talking about the loss of habitat for all species on our... We're talking about a lifeless rock immersed right. in ionizing radiation as the nuclear power plants melt down. That's not for me. If somebody wants to go live in a bunk bunker and try to secure the services of the slaves who will serve them, well, that's not the life for me, either as a slave or as the bunker owner. So, you know, I just don't see that that's a viable option going forward. And it's, it's really interesting, Guy, because, you know... The there's an element of, you know, having grown up in the 1950s of, you know, almost going back to the black and white films of that time addressing uh, as we're waiting for annihilation. Put your head, man, head you, head well, no, not, not that part of it. You know, but, you know, for instance, like a movie like On the Beach, which was about the Australians waiting for the radiation cloud to come from Europe and the, the Americas to eventually, you know, they, they would all they would all die, too. You know, and kind of what the guy's saying is, what you know, we could, we could show some decency, and move ahead no. socially. Or what I think will just happen is, well, number one, like Obama said, the plan of action will be just lower taxes on the rich from the Republicans, <laughs> and you know, the other will be, I think people will just say, well, let it rip. <laughs> I mean, we'll just say, well, tune before we go. But isn't that the response of some some have as well? If it's if it's if it look if it's this bleak, we're just going to enjoy the party, right? Of, of course, of course, people yeah. have always been doing that, partying like it's nineteen ninety nine since at least nineteen ninety nine, probably eighteen ninety nine, probably before that. I, I want to read a line to you from the paper by Strona and Bradshaw that indicates the level of hope these two conservation biologists have in the wake of rapid environmental change. Quote. Life could survive in peculiar habitats such as hydrothermal vents and a rogue, seemingly desert earth wandering across the universe could still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. That's what we're counting on? Yeah, that's not real hopeful. But now, um, to push back again, back, uh, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but a while back, you predicted that it would all come crashing down in 2026. That's only four years away. You you want to stand by that? Or you do want to revise that date? My work depends upon the work of other scholars. So if the scholars I quote is correct, and in this case it's Jennifer McKinnon from the Scripps Institution and James Anderson 
the professor emeritus from Harvard, the atmospheric scientist famous for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone hole. And he, he said, and this is quoted in Forbes on January 15, 2018, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero. That was after a presentation he delivered in Chicago. And Jennifer McKinnon has more recently come around to the same idea. If, if we have that sort of environmental change going from white ice to dark blue ocean, then that will produce profound changes in the environment. And the peer-reviewed literature, a paper in Science a few years ago, indicated that the Arctic is the planetary air conditioner. If we, if we lose the ice in the Arctic, we are in very serious trouble. Mm-hmm. And it is, uh, you know, the, the first uh, the first American, by the way, to sail both directions through the Northwest Passage uh, is an Iowan, a guy named David Thorson, maybe you know him. And, uh, he, you know, years ago he tried, he tried to do that for the longest time, couldn't pull it off, and then suddenly, boom, wide open passage. Right. Yay. Yeah. Anyway, you know, hey, uh, yeah, no, yeah, yes, that's the response of some. There's shipping lanes, woo! Right. Uh, great, great consume more. Greater access for our military. <laughs> that's, right. Uh, that's that's well, that's kind of stuff I read every day, and you know, most people just don't understand the importance of habitat. They don't even know what habitat is. They think it's going to the grocery store and bringing home food that we can cook on our electric ranges, and yeah. and then beyond habitat, what does it mean? We you know, because we don't know what habitat is, it's difficult for us to accept that ours might be changing, and certainly changing fast enough to cause our own extinction. We're afraid to even talk about death in this society, much less death of everybody. It just, we, we're just afraid to talk about other people dying. You know, I grew up in sort of a typical family, born in 1960, and that was just something that we never talked about, death. It was as if it was never going to happen. And, of course, right. we know that it happens to everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, one, one more quick question uh, before we got to run to a break, Guy. Uh, you know, even though you see the end is near, you're still active and involved. Why? Why not just go to parties, you know, plant flowers, hang out with the grandkids? Well... I knew that we were headed for a pretty dire situation at the age of 19 in 1979, so I decided not to have children, and that means I don't have any grandchildren. Oops, I was so much. <laughs> but, but no, you're right. Why don't I just party like it's 1999? And the reason for that is, one, I can't help myself. I'm a professor, and I feel this obligation to inform people, even though I haven't received a paycheck since I walked away from that life on May 1st, 2009. And I, I still feel like there's p p the way people act in the face of impossible odds is a judge of their character. Why would I not inform people what's going on in the world if I know? That would be like medical doctors through the 1960s who didn't tell their patients that they had a terminal diagnosis. It was only in the early 1970s that the medical community decided the ethical approach was to tell people when they were dying and to give them an approximate time frame of how long they were going to live. And I, this, is, this is similar in that we're talking about the loss of habitat for our species and therefore all of us going extinct. It's not that big a difference from telling the truth about a terminal diagnosis. And by the way, to wrap up that idea, we all got a terminal diagnosis at birth. After all, birth is a sexually transmitted disease that is proven <laughs> fatal in every case. <laughs> well, on that note, Charles, you want to turn well, Charles, I mean, by the way? Yeah, I'm, Charles, I'm actually a palliative care physician, so I he knows about I absolutely understand, you know, the, the context you're trying to uh, put out for us. Yes. And um, I, I suspect that the dislodgements that will occur uh, will accelerate the, the process of uh, extinction because it, it will be it will end up with a fight all against one for what little resources are left well as the as the as the as the talk show host here and hopefully the remaining well, the big problem is he loses a big topic for talking of, 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 oh, I don't mind, <laughs> I don't mind uh, yeah. anyway I, I, I still have hope uh, I, I still keep going I, I think honesty and truth is really important 
but I still uh, I, I, I keep fighting because I believe we still have a shot at it I, but guy I, I really value your perspective I think it's a, a good uh, kick in the kick in the head that we need once in a while <laughs> so well I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you gentlemen very much so thank you for that opportunity today folks we've been talking with Guy McPherson when we come back from a short break uh, Charles and I are going to be discussing affirmative action as it's run, as it run its course uh What will the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision say about it? Back in a minute on the Fallon Forum.